flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Struck wonder at the mention of your name. Filled with wonder, awe struck wonder at the mention of your name. Filled with wonder. Awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. things 
out of us. All around, hope is rising up from this old ground. Out of chaos, life is being found in you. You make beautiful things, you make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things, you make beautiful things out of us. So this week we will we'll wrap up the book of First Samuel, and we'll, we'll start in chapter 31, and we'll finish actually in Second Samuel. So as you're turning to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 31, I'll remind you in the last chapter we saw how David reacted differently. We looked at how David reacted differently uh, when he was in distress than did King Saul. Uh, we've seen in the past few lessons, the past few chapters, that uh, uh, Saul came to this point of distress because the Philistines were gathered to war with him and, and he couldn't hear from God because he had no relationship with God. He was asking other people to speak to God for him. He was getting nothing back. So in his distress, he resorted to going and, and talking to the witch of Endor. Last week, we saw David reacted to the stress differently. David consulted with God in prayer. Then he was sent away. Remember, he was living with the Philistines. The Philistines said, we don't want him fighting with us because he'll, his allegiance is ultimately to the Israelites. Send him back home. When he went home, he found that the Ziklag, the city he'd been living in, had been sacked by the Amalekites and, and all the women and the children taken the city burned. And we saw that he, again, he leaned on his relationship with God to uh, prevail against the Amalekites. He and he prevailed. He prevailed not because of his own might. Remember, they had walked for three days, 70 miles in three days, 200 of them. A third of them couldn't go on any further. They were weak. 
but they prevailed because God was on their side, that God's hand of providence was working on the side of David, that they came across this uh, Egyptian slave that had witnessed what happened and knew where the Malachites had went. And so David was victorious. As we turn to chapter 31, uh, the story takes us back to the battlefield. The battle is now actually going on between King Saul and the Israelites and the Philistines. And the Philistines had been great, gaining more and more of, of the promised land, more and more of the ground of, the ground of Israel, and uh, they were fighting to put away Israel once and for all. But they had made a critical oversight because they had just sent away David and his army. So we, we can know they weren't going to have this once and for all victory that they really wanted. At verse 1 it says, Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain on Mount Gilboa. They, that's where they were encamped. They were being defeated in their own camp. And Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons, and the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchizedek, Saul's son. So this has been, this whole book has been the tale of, of two kings, and now it turns into the tale of, of two battles of those kings. David was, we looked at last week, David battling with, with God on his side, and now we see Saul battling only with his own capabilities because he has no relationship with God. It's, so it's interesting at the same time that, at the same time that David was battling uh, using his army of misfits. He's got 600 misfits. That's his army that he's been victorious all these years. David using his army of misfits, and he, with God on his side, was defeating the Amalekites. Well, the Philistines were defeating Saul and the great army of Israel, seasoned warriors, the seasoned warriors of Israel. And you look at this, and you can see some of the results, not promises, but results of life lived in a relationship with, with God and life, lives, the results of life lived not knowing God. You know, these were Israelites. These were God's people, but they didn't know. They didn't well know God. That they uh, had lost sight of Him. So uh, again, we, 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 as we work through this, we've seen we've seen Saul waiting for this battle to happen. That he was waiting with knocking knees and uh, an aching heart and listening to the witch of Endor. And what a tragedy that was that he went to the witch of Endor because we we looked at that and we saw that. Through the witch of Endor, demons, demons spoke destruction into King Saul. They spoke destruction in it, and he not only listened to him, he took to heart. He took to heart their words, and I, I want you to see that again. I want you to see that. I want you to grab onto it, because that's what the enemy has for you. If, if you quit listening to the voice of Jesus... If you quit being sensitive to his spirit and you start listening to the wrong voice, you start letting the demons speak to you, the only thing they have for you is your destruction. They'll lie to you. They'll lie to you. They'll say, who do you think you are? Maybe even if you're moving closer and closer, you're actively trying to press into Jesus Christ, and they come along, if they can get your ear for a moment, they say, who, who do you think you are? I don't know who you think you are, but listen to me and I'll remind you how crummy you are. And they, they want to push you away. And you need to say no. Now, Scripture promises I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You need to quit hearing those voices. You need to press on and, and not listen to them. You know, it's interesting to me when you get into the New Testament and even into the Revelation where Jesus is speaking to the church, and Jesus oftentimes said, those who have ears, let them hear. Those who have ears, let them hear. If you're born again, you have spiritual ears, you should be in this spiritual conversation, and you should be constantly listening for the voice of God and give, giving no place to the enemy. Giving no place. Every, every time you slip back and think, well, this, this is a convenient sin, you just give him place to him. Every time you go back to that sin that you so have enjoyed just for a season, surely Jesus will forgive me. You've just given place for the enemy's voice. And they want destruction for you. You should have no ear for 
the enemy. You should have no ear for demonic spirits. You have, should have no ear for Satan. You should have, however, an ear to hear of God. And as I told you last week, you know, if, if you think that ear for hearing God is waiting on a, an audible voice, that's not often how God is going to speak to you. He's going to speak to you in all manner of ways of events in your life and people he puts in confirmations. And, uh, but if you don't have an ear to hear, you, you won't pick those things up. And, and when you look at the end of King Saul, you should see it, the saddest of ironies, the saddest of ironies. That, and this is, this is it, that when Saul was alive and, and, and the prophet Samuel was also alive, I'm sorry, when prophet Samuel was alive, Saul was still alive, Samuel kept trying to tell Saul things that God would have him to know. And he, he wouldn't listen. He didn't have an ear. When trouble comes, when trouble came, Saul runs to the priest and the prophets and he says, what's God got for me? So there are a lot of people that are exactly like that, that they have no time for God. They have an unwillingness to change their lives to be in this relationship. But this as soon as trouble comes, they say, will you pray for me? Or they might even be so bold as to pray themselves to one they don't know, one they have no relationship, and say, God, rescue me. God, don't you know who I am? Don't you know how devastating this situation is? God chooses not to answer some of those prayers. God answers prayers of people that he's in active relationships with, active ongoing conversations with. So that... The day in this chapter finally comes where Saul's going to pay for his disobedience to God. And I tell you what, that day comes to everyone who lives lives of disobedience. And it might not come in this lifetime, but it might come on the day that they quit breathing. It's coming. It's coming. You, you might look at the ungodly of the world and you might say, it seems like they have every advantage possible. And I struggle, I struggle so hard to be a Christian, and I don't seem to have all that. And is, is the struggle worth it? The struggle's worth it. Their day of, of, of uh, vengeance, God's vengeance is coming. Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Boy, that's a, that's a favorite verse. It is? I love that verse. That's a favorite verse in the church. The church loves to repeat that. It, if God be for us, who can be against us? What people don't see, though, what people fail to look at is the, the negative reflection of that verse. There's a, there's a negative reflection that says, if God has turned away from us, or if God is against, even against us, who can possibly be for us? If, if I don't have any of God in me, who can save me? What man can save me? There is none. If we don't have God on our side, we are beyond the capability of any saving. They, the doctors might uh, save you from chemo by putting you through horrible things for a while. But if God's not in, in it, that's, that's all for nothing. If God's not in it, that, that saving will ultimately lead to an eventual death. I don't care if it's 20 years or 30 years later. If God's not in that thing, his, he will have vengeance. You uh, will pay for your sins. So in this chapter, Saul's day of grace is expiring, and God will fulfill what he had said through his prophet Samuel that the Lord was going to remove Saul from being king over Israel. So the battle begins. The battle begins finally. Uh, and the Philistines quickly, it seems, grab, gain the upper hand, and, and Saul sees the soldiers being overrun. He sees them being killed in every direction. These, these are the trusted troops of Saul. They've been with him for years as he pursued David. They've been with him for years as he fought the, the battles of Israel and fought off other, other countries and other peoples. And, and he sees them. They're, they're falling every which way. And then he sees his own sons get killed. The ones that weren't dead, those of the Troops of Israel that weren't were being killed were running for their lives. They were fleeing. His sons. That's a big deal. You remember Jonathan? 
Jonathan was the beloved friend of David, and he gets killed along with, his, along with two of his brothers, Abinadab and Mount Chizua. And that seems so tragic. You might look at it and say, that seems so unfair. Jonathan, Jonathan, he pledges allegiance to David. He fought for David with his father. He tried to reason with his father. He told David, I, I will rec when you become king, I will recognize you as king. I will be submitted to you. And that, now he dies in his battle. As Saul's sons pay a price for his disobedience. Disobedience sometimes has a generational cost. Seems unfair to us, but God knows what he's doing. But as tragic as this seems, it, it, it may be that God knew what he's doing in removing all the obvious heirs to Saul's throne. And one of them was Jonathan. But Jonathan had pledged his allegiance to David. I think we can see in Jonathan's situation something that we don't always see well. Perhaps in allowing Jonathan to die in this battle with his father, God spared Jonathan the future heartbreak of having to side with David against his own family, against his own brothers, had they not all perished. Can you imagine what kind of situation Jonathan would have been in if, if the people were, were pushing, even, even if it wasn't his brothers, if the people of Israel were saying, you, you should be an heir to your father, and you should fight against David, and he's taken out of that situation, and I think, I think one day when we, we step into heaven, we will be so amazed when we see all these stories play out, that stories we don't in the present day well understand, how God, is, how God extends sometimes his mercy to those who are taken at a young age. We don't see what God has spared sometimes those individuals in the future. We're not, we're not privy to those details. You know, it's, it's so odd. We're, we're odd creatures, and uh, we, we can't understand the very thing that we put our hope in. We can't understand that God could remove some at a young age and spare them something from the future, but where is our hope as a church? Where is our hope as Christians today? Our hope is in the rapture. Our hope is that God takes us out before something terrible happens on the earth. But when God does that on an individual basis, we can't see it and we don't understand it. But yet, that's exactly where our hope is at. We're saying, God, we sense something terrible is coming to the earth. We read your word. We know the tribulation is coming and we'll put our trust in you taking us out before trouble comes. And we can't understand that God could love someone individually and do the same thing. If, if you need to make some personal adjustments to get right with the Lord, given the day we live in, I'd say you need to get busy doing that. Because a rapture is coming. A rapture is coming. God doesn't grade on the curve. You either have an active relationship with him in that day or you don't. You either have an active relationship with him or you say, Lord, Lord, there's been some mistake. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. At verse 3, it said, And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded from the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through Therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me, but his armor bearer would not, for he was so afraid. Therefore Saul took his sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul, this battle is going the wrong way for Saul, and he's hit with many arrows. He's severely wounded. He knows the battle is lost. He knows he's mortally wounded. So he pleads with his armor bearer, take your sword and kill me. See, he, he didn't want to kill himself. He'd take your sword and kill me. But the armor barrel refused. He, he refused to do it. And, and he, you know, why did he refuse? I don't know. 
you know, perhaps the armor bearer wouldn't do it because he had such a great respect and awe for the first king of Israel. Perhaps he killed himself also because he was afraid of the shame that was going to come to him and what was going to come to him. It was known that he felt in his assignment. He was, he was assigned to protect the king. And he, at this point, he, he's failed to do so. At this point, as you read in the narrative, there, there are Israelites, this battle is going on in a valley. There are Israelites who live on, on, on a mountainside on the opposite side, and, and they can see that the battle is going poorly, and, and it says that so they, they flee. So they take off. They left their cities and their possessions beside, behind and just run away, and, and the Philistines would would soon move into their cities and have their possessions. Verse 8, it says, And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa, and they cut off his head and stripped his armor and sent it into the land. The Philistines ran about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people, and they put his armor in the house of Ashtra, and they fastened his body to the wall of Beshion. So the Philistines come back the next day, they cut the heads off of Saul and his sons, and they, they tie their bodies to a wall and they place salt. They take Saul's armor and they place it in the shrine of their pagan god, Ashtoreth. And it sounds so gruesome to us. Then they, but they then parade his head throughout the land to proclaim everyone we were victorious. Here's the head of the great king of Israel. And these, these pagan people, they, they use this victory over Saul to glorify their gods and, and really to mock the living God of Israel. You know, it, with, with Saul's death, these pagan people did everything possible. You look at what they did. They de decapitated him. They took the head. They, they put their armor with their idol. They tied their bodies to a city wall. They did everything possible to insult Saul, to insult Israel, to insult Jehovah God. You know, in, in that culture, to have your body so uh, badly treated, so disgraced was in that culture, considered to be a fate worse than death. And in the Middle East, it's still that way. We should be able to understand some of these things because these, these thoughts continue forward into our day. Most of you can remember a few years back when the, the U.S. consulate was overrun in, in Benghazi, uh, Libya, and they killed our ambassador. But they didn't just kill him. They took his body and they drug it through the streets and they they dishonored it in every way they could because in their view, that's, that's even worse than death. At verse 11, it says, When the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his son from the wall of Beshen and came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. So you read that and you need to, you need to look back to God, this is all the story of the pure bloodline advancing from the garden to the cross. And, and because of that, keeping that bloodline pure, God has put into these Israelites uh, their genealogy experts, that they know their generations. I don't know. How many of you know your generations beyond two? You know, you're lucky if you, three maybe. You know, there might be somebody who has researched that, and you know, but most of us don't know. Uh, I remember our great-grandparents, but I don't know who was before them. These people of Israel, they know their genealogies. They know who they are. They know who they have been. They remember their history. That, that's what's behind what happens here. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 11, we, to remind you, we read of a, a pagan man named Nahash, and if you remember the event, he surrounded the city of Jabesh Gilead, and uh, they, they were under siege. He was an Ammonite, and he agreed to let all the people of Jabesh Gilead live if they'd be his servants going forward, and he could pluck out the right eye of every man. In that situation, if you remember, the, the people of the city said, ah, Give us if, if you give us seven days to see if there's anyone to help us, if no one's coming at the end of seven days, we will come out and we will be your servants and you can pluck out our right eyes. And this is, It seemed like a crazy thing, but Nahash said, okay, you have seven days. It, 
tells you something about what he thought of Israel. That he saw in Israel a dysfunctional nation. That he saw in Israel tribes that weren't perfectly getting along. Uh, he saw in Israel people who were self-centered. He, he said, send your men out. Send your runners out and see if there are any help. But what he didn't anticipate, he didn't anticipate that King Saul had a soft spot in his heart for, for Jabesh Gilead. Why? Because the Israelites remember their history. You should remember further back, further back beyond that, uh, in the book of Judges, we read about the Levite who to save his own skin, allowed his concubine to be raped and killed overnight. But by, by the men of the city of Gabeah, and then in that story, you remember he cut her body up into 12 pieces and sent a piece to each of the tribes of Israel, calling them to come battle against the city of, of Gabeah. And Gabeah was a Benjamite city. Instead of answering the call to arms of the tribe of Benjamin, they fought with the city, their fellow uh, Benjamites in the city of Gabeah. And there's one other group who refused to answer the call to arms, and they were the people of this city, Jabesh Gilead. And this is, this is what's in the background of what you read in this chapter, why they came to honor a fallen Saul. Again, Israel was, and, and they continue to be a nation that remembers their history. And When the Hash had the city surrounded, and they had little hope of anyone coming to rescue them part of the reason no one thought anyone would come to rescue them because they were the city who failed 300 years before that to answer to call to arms when everyone else was fighting they just stayed home they, they were they were thought to be cowards so who's Nahash would have thought who's possibly going to come and save them the people of Jabesh Gilead thought who's possibly going to come save us when others called for help, we didn't 300 years ago. It wasn't this generation, but 300 years ago, our people didn't answer the call of the rest of Israel. We just stayed home. So, so we've been looked at poorly ever since then. Well, the way, the way it went, that uh, Israel, Israel surrounded the Gabeah, and they killed almost all the men of the tribe of Benjamin. And uh, right after the battle, the, the other tribes of Israel, they, they were remorseful. They thought, what have we done? We, I think it was 60 men left alive. Every, all the women were gone. They say, we've just arranged for the extinction of one of the tribes that God has set for Israel. So what, what can we do? And they come up with this plan. They thought, there's, uh, there's, there's another people that didn't, battle in this battle that there were people of Jabesh Gilead and if you remember what they did they sent they sent men out to slay all the men of Jabesh Gilead and take the women of that city uh, who were virgins everyone else is killed they brought the virgins back as the wives for the remaining men of Benjamin and so all the Benjamites at the day were reading of their grandmothers every one of their have a grandmother in their past who were from the city of Jabesh Gilead. And so when when the Hashes had the city in siege and Saul heard this, Saul says, This is the these are the people of my heritage. My grandmother was one of these people and so he had this soft spot in his heart and he went and and he attacked the Hash and he, he rescued the city of Jabesh Gilead. Uh, now he's dead. And there's still the people who remember their history and the people of Jabesh Gilead, they remember this is the Saul, this is the king who is the reason I still have my right eye, is the reason I'm not a servant to Nahash, the Ammonite. He came to our rescue. We owe him something. So what they did is they traveled all night and they stole the decapitated bodies of Saul and his sons and they, they burned them. Why did they burn them? Because 
if the Philistines found them, they would dig them up and they would drag them again. They would hang them on a wall. They would continue to disgrace them. So they burned them and they buried the bones of Saul and his sons under a tree at Jabesh Gilead. You look at this and say, well, that's really something. That's really something. They risked themselves to honor Saul that way. But if you step back, you, you think, well, that was an odd loyalty, wasn't it? That Saul was so scared of this battle, and these people once again, again didn't enter into a battle. Maybe, maybe they could have served Saul better had they come before he died, had they come and, and battled beside him. But that's not what they did. But they risked their lives to honor his memory. I'd, I want to stick my toes in the Second Samuel chapter one just a little bit this morning to finish this out. So, so Saul dies in this battle. David, at the same time, was victorious in his battle against the Amalekites. And David returns home as Second Samuel opens. He returns home to Ziklag. It's been burned out, but he's regained everything. He's regained a spoil of the Amalekites, he's got his women and children back, and they, they travel home, and David's waiting for word of what happened in the battle between Saul and the Philistines. And on the third day, it says, word came. At verse 2, it says, Behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes torn and earth upon his head, and so it was when he came to David that he fell on the earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said to him, Out of the camp of Israel I am escaped. And David said to him, How went the matter? I pray thee tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people are fallen dead, and Saul and Jonathan and his sons are all dead. And David said to the young man that told him, How do you know that Saul and Jonathan and his son be dead? And the young man told him and said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Geboa, behold, Saul leaned against his spear, and lo, the chariots of the horsemen followed after, hard after him, and when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me, and I answered, Here I am. He said to me, Who are you? And I answered him, I said, I'm an Amalekite. He said to me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me, because my life is not yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure he could not live after that he was fallen. I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, I brought them to you, my Lord. You know, I, 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 I can't perfectly see the scene, but I read this. I can almost see this Amalekite smiling as he delivers the news to David, thinking that David would be delighted that King Saul, who has hunted him for his life all these years, is finally dead because David could now, with Saul being dead, David could now uh, put on the, this crown and put on the royal bracelets and... and be king. And this guy's an Amalekite. This, who, who were the people that David just pursued and, and conquered? They were Amalekites. And news traveled back then. As news travels down. He, we don't know, but he, he may have known of David's victory there. He may have known of the great spoil that David took from that victory. But you read this, you got to re hang on to what we just read in the last chapter of Saul's death. We read of Saul being hit with arrows and being with his armor bearer, bearer and asking his armor bearer to slay him, which the man refused. And so Saul, Saul leaned on his own sword. This is, this is not the same account. This is a fabrication. Uh, I think as you read this, the only truth in, in what this man is, is saying to David is that he came upon Saul. He, he, it would seem close enough that maybe he witnessed the last moments between Saul and his armor bearer. But once Saul was dead, he came upon the body before the Philistines came the next day and he stole the crown and the bracelet. And there's, great, there's such great irony in, in this. The man who plundered Saul's crown and, and the royal bracelet was an Amalekite. Irony, irony, because the Amalekites were the, some of the people that God told Israel to slay, leave none with breath. Kill man, woman, children, animal. And you should, you should remember the situation. This, the Amalekites were the people who Saul was supposed to wipe out and after the battle, Samuel comes, 
And Saul says, guess what? I've been obedient to the Lord. And, and Saul says, then, what is the bleeding of the sheep and the lowing of the cattle I hear? Saul failed to be obedient to God. And great irony that this man is a Malachite. This man is one of the people that Saul should have exterminated from the land in the protection of the pure bloodline. And, and here, this Amalekite is still living, and Saul's dead. And this Amalekite has robbed the crown of Israel from Saul. And he comes to David, and I think he's expecting great reward. David's going to be king. He's going to be so happy. He's going to reward me greatly. And verse 11 says, Then David took hold on his clothes and tore them, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening. For Saul and, and for Jonathan's son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. You read that, do you think in the last chapter David was going to fight on the side of the Philistines? I don't think there was a chance that that was going to happen. 13, and, and David said to a young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I'm the son of a stranger in Malachi. And David said unto him, how was thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called for one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. He smote him that he died. And David said to him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth has testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. So this Canaanite man claimed to have killed the anointed of God, and he carried to David this good news of Saul's demise. And what you have here is a Malachite fool, an Amalekite fool, thinking that this is going to be good news to David. He didn't understand who David was. You know, for all these years when Saul pursued David, wanting David's life, all those opportunities David had to slay Saul, and he would not. He would not touch God's anointed. And here comes an uncircumcised man saying, I have slain Saul, whether he did or not. There's only one thing for David to do. You claim to have killed God's anointed. There's only one answer for you. So that closes uh, the book of 1 Samuel and, and starts into 2 Samuel. And I, I think I think from here, i, I got to work it out. I don't know if we're going to follow 2 Samuel all the way through because uh, ultimately what I'm doing is pursuing the, I'm being showing you the pure bloodline that leads to Jesus Christ. I think we're about to a, a jumping off point as David is king. Uh, the, soon, I'm planning on, I think we'll jump forward and we'll, we'll get into the Gospels. and compassionate He's slow to anger and rich in love The Lord is gracious and compassionate
Lord is gracious and compassionate. As we close the day thinking about David and all that he went through, he might have a time that from time to time thought, I don't know if the Lord's in this. I don't know where God's at. I don't know how Saul can continue to pursue me. And I can't even leave my own country. And where's God at? And maybe that's where you've been in your own life. As you look at your situation and you say, God, how can you, how can you allow this? Where are you? But David didn't turn his back on the Lord. And he stayed obedient. He stayed in the conversation. He's, he continued to pray. He continued to read God's word. I wonder if he read Job sometimes. It says the Lord lives and the Lord takes away. I wonder when he got news of the demise of Jonathan, if he went back and leaned on that, that the Lord lives and the Lord takes away. You look at the life of David, and he was a sinner just as I am, just as you are. And yet the Bible says, God said he's a man after my own heart. After. He pursued. He's a, a man who pursues after my heart. And just as this song says, that you look at the sins of David, they were great. And yet the Lord set them away so far away from David as far as the east is from the west and God said he's my man and you have that same opportunity if you're in pursuit of God if you're pressing into the relationship that God can say that's mine this one's mine let's, let's pray as we close dear Heavenly Father you're an awesome God I thank you for the life of David I thank you for the hands that wrote down these 
words of yours so that we can read and we can see you, we can understand you more. We're so thankful for Jesus Christ who has died, who bore our sins so that our sins can't be removed as far as the east is from the west. And God, one more time, I want to thank you for the life of Larry Stadoff. The Lord lives and the Lord takes away. Your word says that it's appointed once to man, for man to die. And that promise comes to each of us as it's come to Larry. But Father, you've also promised that we who are in Christ, we will live forever. So Father, we celebrate, we celebrate the life of Larry. We celebrate that we have the same opportunity. That we can know glory. So help us, give us your Holy Spirit, help us to stand in the times we don't understand, to stand in the times that are difficult, and help us to praise you in all times. That you are our champion, you are glory. And we just want to love you and serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.